Well, it's Adam Curry here with uh, two members of Deep Purple. We have uh, John Lord and Roger Glover. I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Well done. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you have a, an album coming out in just a few days, which is uh, titled Nobody's Perfect, uh, which I think we should talk about right now. First of all, the title, Nobody's Perfect. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's true, yeah. Uh, we had a reunion album called Perfect Strangers mm -hmm. uh, in 84, uh, which uh, was kind of a very solid statement, you know, and people might have thought we were being a bit pretentious, calling ourselves perfect. So, mm -hmm. live album, nobody's perfect, I think. So. I don't know if that was the thinking behind it. I Nothing to do with me. Yeah. <laughs> actually, that was Richie's idea. Uh, we have a very hard time thinking up titles for albums or songs or anything. Mm -hmm. In fact, making any kind of decision at all comes, comes very hard to this band. And why is that? Well, we live all over the world, for a start. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we, we don't get together that often. We get together when we when we work on stage or work in the studio, mm -hmm. occasionally. So there's a lot of international so, uh, phone calls mm, going yeah. back and forth. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the album is a live album, which was done, was it on your last tour? 87. Yes. Yeah. Now, was it all recorded in one place? Or? Uh-uh. No, it's, it's from uh, this country uh, from the, and from Europe. Mm -hmm. Various towns here, there, and everywhere. Now, so... Besides that, there's also one uh, single, which is Hush, which was, I believe, was it the, f was it the first yeah. major hit for, for Deep Purple that you re-recorded in the studio? Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, it was, uh, it's 20 years ago today. Sergeant Pepper told me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hush came out in 68, and this is 88, and someone pointed that out to us the other day. And we were thinking, actually, of doing it as uh, part of the stage act, as an encore, just, but we always fool around at the end of the, the songs. And um, we never got around to doing it. And when we were in the studio mixing the live album, which I'll hasten to add is really live, there's no uh, studio ad additions. It's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's, again, the reason for the name Nobody's Perfect, because right. it's there, yeah, warts and all, as it were. A few glitches in there, but still. Um, so we were just having a jam one night. We mixed the album in England, and there was a pub close by. And we unfortunately found, or fortunately found ourselves in the pub one night, and we came back a little the worst for wear, <laughs> and just Speak started, yourself. Started, <laughs> started jamming around. Mm -hmm. um, those moments when you, unguarded moments are usually the best moments. And Hush came out of it, it's a live jam in the studio. Well, what was the thought behind doing uh, this album? Did you just said, hey, we'll put this album, you didn't want to write new songs, or was there any main reason? Um, we hadn't uh, really thought of a reason for it, we just decided it'd be nice to, to, to tape some of the shows that we did, so uh, we went into the, uh, the logistics of it, and we bought a 24-track machine and just sort of shoved it into the, the desk out front, the sound desk, mm -hmm. and recorded everything. And uh, the results were good, we liked them, so it seemed like a nice time to put a live album out. I think I th live albums are a, you either love them or hate them, I don't think you're sort of any a grey area with a, with a live album. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think people who like Deep Purple will find a lot to like on this album. It's got, obviously, last year's versions of yesterday's songs, and, you know. Oh, I quite like that. That's not <laughs> right. Last year's versions uh, of yesterday's songs. I don't yeah, know what it means, but it, <laughs> uh, So I think it, it's, it's going to be of interest, uh, and it's, it's very exciting. It's got all that uh, up-close, up-front feeling that you can only get, I th well, this band can, on, on stage. We can't the studio, you have to really work hard for spontaneity, and uh, or you get spontane spontaneity, but but then you don't get the right take. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a juggling match after that. Right. If there's such thing as a, a juggling match. Mm. Oh, oh, there is as far as we're concerned. In uh, I guess it was '71, you did uh, Made in Japan, mm -hmm. which was uh, to a lot of people, you know, the best Deep Purple live album ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it compare to to this one? In uh, in many ways, you know, like recording techniques, everything. Um, actually, I think the recording techniques are, are pretty much, I think, obviously there are some improvements, but the way we recorded it is, is, is as hit and miss as it was then. That was done over three nights, and uh, certainly was a feeling in the band of, uh-oh, we're being recorded. So it was just, so on, certainly on the first night, there's a woodenness, and most of the material on Made in Japan came from the second night after we'd relaxed mm -hmm. a little. Um, and it was great doing this, doing it this way because we recorded night after night after night. And in fact, we kept, I think, about 17 or 18 gigs worth of tapes, which is a lot of tape to go through. 
Um, but it was fun finding out all these little uh, mistakes and things, which we kept in, of course. Well, what, what kind of mistakes are there? Uh, wrong words, wrong <laughs> words. <laughs> Mostly wrong words. And, yeah. uh, I know Ian Gillan wouldn't mind me saying this, but uh, he, he rewrites the songs most nights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I think, <clears throat> again, if it's going to be live, it might as well uh, be just that. I mean, OK, you, you use modern uh, available technology to, mm -hmm. to make it sound good, yeah. but, but I don't think there's any real point in uh, uh, you know, changing it, uh, f using the benefits of being in the studio, just just to make it sound better. Speaking of which, uh, if we talk about keyboards for a second, of course, uh, you used to play, uh, I guess it was the organ. Yeah. And do you use an organ for for this album as well, or was it uh, a lot of synthesizers mixed in? Or uh, not at all? I used a, few, a couple of synthesizers mainly for just effects. I don't actually play solos on them or, or, or stand around them too long. I'm still an organ player. Mm -hmm and an occasional pianist. Um, they're great because they give you an ability to, to use sounds that, I, that were never available to me 10 years ago. And so, uh, and so, and they are useful in that respect, but I don't use them a lot. Playing on a Hammond organ is a, is a lost art. Yeah, there, there are many, many people, people that can yeah. play it the way John plays it. And do you, do you still have, was it the big... The big Leslie speakers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, and you use that. And oh you, yeah, it's, 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 the technology is still here. <laughs> it's, it's vanishing, but it's... Uh, how, how about the evolution of, uh, of keyboards and synthesizers in, in rock music? I, I think it's the biggest single advance in, in this business. It's been in keyboards. It's been... Uh, I always say that I'm, I'm very glad I'm not starting over today because I wouldn't know where to start. I wouldn't know mm -hmm. what to play. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the available keyboards, I mean, there's so many of them. Um, I think it's calming down a bit. I, I, I think it's going... I mean, I've spoken to a lot of keyboard players lately who've been looking for warmth again. You know, it's very, very fine to have this tinkling, bright, digital key keyboard sound, you know, which is massively effective and records very, very well. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it misses a kind of a warmth, which is there in some of the early synthesizers and, and certainly in the organ and the piano. You know, uh, you, you can't make an organ d do something unless you can play it. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, you have to be able to play a synthesizer too. But there are buttons you can press, which are extremely helpful. Right. You know, if you. Uh, and I, I'm, I would like to see some of that warmth coming back. It's, it's, uh, it's bright, some of it. Right. Uh, and it just kind of stops there. You know, it doesn't go over the footlights <coughs> too, too well. It's also the danger that um, bands are beginning to sound the same because they're all using the same samples and the same factory presets. Mm -hmm. So individualism is being lost to that extent. If, you're, if it's just one person playing a keyboard, your individuality, individuality comes out in the way you play not in the sounds that you use. So which bands do you think sound so much alike then today? I think Putting there are a whole, whole genre of, of bands that, that all seem to sound the same. They all sound like everyone else that's on the radio, especially in America. Mm -hmm. They've all got that uh, huge drum sound in echo that's, that's a sample. Mm -hmm. um, they've all got the harmony chorus and the, all the guitar sounds seem the same. And as John said, that high tinkling intermittent sound that they put in between the, the crash chords. Mm -hmm. So they're neither hard rock or pop, they're sort of somewhere in between. They're trying to bridge both Well, let me ask you this then. Rivers. Do, you, do you hear a lot of Deep Purple influences in, uh, in the Bon Jovis of today? I didn't say Bon Jovi. No, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that. Anyway, I think they're, I mean, if, if, if they are the epitome of what Roger was talking about, at least they were the, uh, probably the first one in. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear influences only uh, fleetingly now. I mean, uh, but I think we, I think we started something. Um, I think we're around to finish it. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, but uh, yeah, I, I hear, yeah, I hear some of the things that we learnt being traded off in in, uh, in the present mm -hmm. about a number of bands and things. Getting back to the the tour, which was uh, last year. Now, last year I think we heard that there was going to be a concert video to go with the. Uh, with the whole tour, is that still in the works, or is that off? Or especially because we have the album out now. We didn't do any concert videos of the last tour, to, to my knowledge. I don't know who you heard that from. You know how these rumors. Yeah, I know. <laughs> maybe I started it. I don't know. Well, it's, have you thought about one for the future? Maybe. I think when we go out, this actually this wasn't supposed to be a touring year. We we tend to go in two-year cycles, and the, the tour was last year. And I think the only reason we're doing the states again is because Richie broke his finger halfway through the last tour. And, didn't get finished. You want to hear the rumor I heard about that one? Mm. Yeah. That he broke it during a solo. He did. Yeah. How is that? How is that possible? Well, actually, he was throwing the guitar, the guitar up. up. 
Oh, and okay. I was doing the flash bit at the end, and I did a few twirls and caught him badly. Oh. It would have been better if he'd have broken it like that, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would have been so much cooler. Like, oh, sorry, I got so tangled up there. But he did finish the show with a broken finger. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, it's uh, listening to the tapes of that night, which is in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, you can hear the moment that it happened. There's all this noise coming from the guitar as he's throwing it up, and suddenly there's an ominous silence mm. for about ten seconds, and then it, the guitar cranks up again. But do you have that on the album? Or no, we didn't use that. No. Oh, why not? Well, that would have been so great. We used a. There's an X-ray of his hand <laughs> on the inside cover, which mm -hmm. is quite nice. Um, let me see. Now, there's uh, there's something that I that I picked up because you know I, you can go back into Deep Purple's history. You can go way back if you want to. But I found this album, which is uh, <coughs> David Coverdale. It has a little sticker here, The Voice of Deep Purple. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, uh, Roger, you produced this, mm. I believe. Now, maybe you could, because I, I think a lot of people don't know that David Coverdale, who's now in Whitesnake, uh, John, you played in Whitesnake yeah. for a while. Mm -hmm. Could you just give us this the whole story of how Deep Purple and, and David Coverdale all fit in together? Do you want to do this? David Coverdale replaced Ian Gillen. Mm -hmm at the same time that Glenn Hughes replaced me. That was in 73. And Deep Purple carried on with him as the lead singer and, and Glenn as the bass player for a while. Um, then Richie left a few years later. And I think by 76, the band stopped altogether. March. In the meantime, uh, David wanted to do some solo albums. And since in that period, I mean, I'd never worked in, in Deep Purple with David. Um, I was working as a producer. And he approached me and said, will you produce my solo? album. And that was it. And that was it. Because I'm sure that there are a lot of people that really don't know that at all. I did two albums with him, actually. There was a follow-up to that one as well called North Winds. See, I don't have that. I just have this one with the plastic still on. That's all I have. So. <laughs> played it a lot. Then, uh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> now, there are a lot of other uh, uh, super groups from uh, the 60s and 70s that are uh, uh, that are around. Let's see, we have Yes, uh, Aerosmith, Moody Blues, just to name a few. Uh, what do you think of them? I d uh, well, um, if I could just say that I, I don't, I try not to make myself into a music critic. Yeah, you know. Far too many of those about, and, mm -hmm, uh, and sure. uh, you know, they're, they're just <coughs> other guys doing the same job as I'm doing and trying to do it as well as as we try and do it. I, I'm, I like a, a lot of what they, uh, what the, I mean, the Moody's, for example, that, that always reminds me of a certain time. Mm -hmm. Aerosmith, I never knew a great deal about because. Being English and they being American, so I didn't. And they were doing something different to to, to what we were, and, and they were out when we were, and I didn't. I just didn't catch up with them. Um, I think I was in White Snake at the time, and I didn't know what <coughs> the hell was going on in the rest of the world at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I just like to I like to see the longevity because uh, it it exists in all other forms of music, and it's starting it's starting now to exist in rock and roll. And I think that's good. I don't think it's. Uh, a bad thing, like uh, like some critics seem to think it is. It's, I think it's a, an interesting facet that, that now people who've been in the business for some time can still prove themselves and still go out and and say and stand behind uh, or beside rather uh, a band that's 15 years their junior. Now, Roger, when you go out uh, <clears throat> on the road, what what kind of people are turning up for your shows? Uh, is it a mix of new fans and and older fans? Mm. Before the show, I go out and interview every one of them personally. And get sure you do. Data. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to see uh, the fact that it, uh, there's two generations of fans out there. Mm -hmm. Lots of young, in fact, more young kids than, than older kids. Um, I, th I wouldn't say, I could, I'd like to hazard a guess as to what it is, but I'd say it's probably about 25% of the older people. I mean, the, f the 35 to 40 year old age group don't really go to rock concerts. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was Frank Zappa had a, a great quote on that. He said, he said the, the 40 year olds don't want to go to rock concerts and have some 15 year old throw up on his new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah, is all right. Um, but it's, yeah, I think it's fantastic that we can uh, have both audiences. And something to be thankful for. I just like to, uh, to ask you a question about, uh, about the album. The songs, uh, the classics, such as you know, Smoke on the Water, will they sound that much different from? The original versions. Some change more than others. Besides the words, then. That is. <laughs> uh, some change more than others. I think. I'd hazard uh, to say that I think we play better now than we used to. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not have the fire or the youth that we had, but I think we've got something else. And because of that, the songs <laughs> change. So white sticks. Yeah, what is, <laughs> what is this something else? <laughs> 
Maturity, inner vision. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, just for the benefit of the fans, I'm sure you've even told, you know, you've told the story lots of times. We even had bets going, I think, with Richard Marks in, in Montreux about the song <coughs> Smoke on the Water. <coughs> Could you run through the story again? Mm -hmm. It just, uh, it was not meant to be a single, it was an album track. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it started off as a riff that Richie came up with that had no words. Um, and this happened just at the time we went over to Montreux to a big casino, which is a regular venue on the, on the rock club circuit. And we'd been there several times just to do gigs in the previous years. And we'd arranged to use it for about a month to record an album. We, we had this idea of recording in a live situation, but with no audience, so we could go over and over the songs to make sure they were right, but to get that sound that, that was live. And uh, the day we arrived, there was a Frank Zappa gig there, a matinee in the afternoon, which we were invited to. And we went along to watch it. And about halfway through the gig, someone shot a flare gun up to the ceiling, which is a kind of fake bamboo ceiling. And at first, it didn't seem like very much, but the gig stopped and everyone had to file out. And within about 10 minutes, the place, which is about seven or eight stories high, it was a big building, was a, a blaze. It was the most startling blaze that I'd ever mm -hmm. seen, or you. Fantastic. And uh, it kind of set us back a few days, because now we had nowhere to record. And uh, about four or five days later, we found ourselves the only place we could find in Montreux, which is a really sleepy little town on the edge of this beautiful lake, Lake Geneva. Uh, the Grand Hotel was a hotel with a big corridor, ground floor corridor, had the, the right kind of acoustics. And so we moved into there, and... It was closed. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was closed it. for the season. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the guests might have been worried. Well, just walking down the corridor and seeing a guitar solo going on. <laughs> anyway, um, smoke in the water is a phrase that I woke up saying to myself one morning, about three days after the fire, which didn't mean anything. I mentioned it to Ian Gillen, and he said, oh, it sounds like a drug song, better forget that. And uh, this riff and the chord sequence were there without any words, so somehow the idea was born, why don't we write just uh, the story of us coming to Montreux and the, the thing, you know, burning down. And that's really all there is to it. Did Frank Zappa ever come to claim any... Uh, any all he had left was a, was a melted cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, yeah, it everything. Went. It was, I mean, he was great, actually. He stood on the stage with this smoke sort of starting to, and flames beginning to, uh, to flicker around. And he said, uh, he put his guitar gently down, he said, I've got one thing to say. Fire! <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then legged it out of there. Right. It went up so quickly. It was just, we found out later it was a, it was a, uh, what do you call it, a, a rival casino Yeah, from deal? another town. From an, uh, oh, they some idiot with a, you know, or in the song, it's some stupid with a flare gun is the line from the uh -huh. song. Uh, had done it on purpose. It was a, it, it was arson. <laughs> Last question, because you said it was this wasn't going to be a touring year, but it will be a touring yeah. year. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, the way it looks now, um, mid-August, for uh, eight weeks or so, <coughs> here, there, and everywhere. Um, I don't know if there's any spe anything specific yet. Well, yeah, well, there's one. There's one gig at uh, Giant Stadium. Oh, that's right. Uh -huh. Aerosmith, thanks. August fifteenth, I think it is. Yeah, it should Wait, be fun. There's a couple of other bands on, so it should be like a should be summer fun. fest. Great. Kind of and we just we're doing the states or Europe as well. Just the states and Canada, I believe. I'm sure Montreal would love to see you back there. <laughs> yeah, actually, we went back there last year for the launch of uh, the House of Blue Light. Uh -huh. And I went to that the Grand Hotel, yeah. right? Which is which is great. It's now an apartment house. It's not a hotel anymore. But to stand in the very corridor. Yeah, was uh, quite a moving experience. There were some ghosts in that car, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Well, thank you very much for dropping by, both of you. Lots thank of luck on the tour. Thank you. Cheers, and, Adam. Uh, with the album. Thank you. God bless. Yeah.